if you got a good crop. Sorry, I need to this. So the second one, does everybody see this remitting is in record, being recorded on the screen? No? Okay, good. Then I leave it. Um, so the coding uh, then it depends on the good or the bad. Um, actually, coder, if you got good code or bad code to load the data and the same with your car. The second step was ELT, where you then actually made standardized components which were that component ensured and also the flow that you created that you got the standardized code that came out and that you you were more sure that uh, the logic uh, would work if it's done in the right order and and the total picture of what you needed to do in this process was right so it's a bit the same like uh, the manual work till that you have building cars step by step in a, in a predefined process and certain components were, were added to the car in every step. So if we look at in the evolution of the car, the next one is of course that you need to uh, make robots of it. It means that you uh, actually automate really and not make it a manual exercise that you really automate the, um, yeah, the, build, the loading of the data. And that's actually what uh, data warehouse automation tries to do is not have any or reduce it to a minimum. I mean, not have any is, is not possible yet because you still have the single business logic that you need for the reporting and stuff like that. But you want to go as far as possible in this, in this evolution of not having to do manual work. So what is data where, when is data warehouse uh, automation possible? And it's, it's uh, very important to know what are the requirements of this, data, uh, of this automation to then know uh, how is the contradiction or not the contradiction with actually the possibility of matching it with business. Um, well, a very important thing is, of course, repeatability. Yeah. Is, are there multiple, in our case for the loading, are there multiple objects that can be loaded using the same logic? Yeah. And I took the example, of course, of data hub, but because that's where we are talking about. Is that, yeah, all hub objects, types, they are loaded with the same loading logic. Also all satellite, also all links. So, that's already a good thing about the fact that uh, data hold adheres to this to this first rule. But in 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 uh, in uh, to ensure that actually this repeatability works, it also means that another a number of other uh, things need to be true. Like the objects need to be at an atomic level, meaning it should only have one function, like in a data hold, a hub. Is the key contains the keys satellite contains the descriptive information or in this case I put on a link which which represent the business uh, relationship. If that's not the case and there can be multiple uh, functions in one object, it's impossible to or very difficult uh, without any uh, many additional metadata actually to automate. Uh, and the third thing is you need to have an abstraction level. You cannot just automate at the physical level. That's not possible because uh, as you see there, if you are talking about either uh, customers or campaigns, yeah, campaign code and start date and customer uh, and the customer national person ID, you would never match them in a logic to, to actually automate as a physical attribute. But at the moment that you have an abstraction level, it tells you this is a business key, then you are actually automating at the level of business key, and then you can start doing actually the repeatable patterns. And again, here, data, data vault gives us actually the means and through these definitions of these, I would say, specialized uh, um, attributes on how to work actually uh, and how to, to do this logic and how to automate. And the third uh, thing is very important is that there needs to be an unambiguous relationship between the source and the target, because if there is a lot of logic in between, you cannot automate either. So it's very important the repeatability with these two uh, requirements, atomic and abstraction, and then this relationship that needs to be best one to one, because then it's actually the easiest to, uh, to automate. 
If we then look at the second part, we, we are now, we talked about the automation, but what is the actually, what is the requirement of the business? So he, the business actually wants to have an understandable view of the structure of the data and where, which data element is. So what they typically require and what we typically used to communicate with them Actually, when we, we are now a product company, but we also, from 2008, we, we were building these data vault uh, systems at customers. Um, so what they also required and uh, is a, an easy way to communicate. And one, one first thing for that is that conceptual model. A conceptual model is actually a very high level form of model. And it's very easy and very simple and therefore very easy to communicate with the business for that. It's typically at the entity level and also shows the relationship between the entities, but that's typically where it stops. You can put uh, attributes in there, but any level that you go down, and you can then make the logical model, you can make the physical model. The problem is if you start going down, it gets too complex for business. And secondly, if you start doing that, you also lose a lot of flexibility of your data vault model eh? so that's that's the reason why uh, we chose actually to communicate at this level of the conceptual uh, model with uh, with the business a second thing you need is this business taxonomy which is the formal structure of business element eh? representing a certain business domain and let's be clear these uh, taxonomies typically exist for master data eh? you, you will not have a taxonomy for your uh, order lines or order form, whatever, which is not master data. So that's typically for, for master data. Where this is helpful is to understand in all these source systems actually, uh, because you have this whole business taxonomy with all the terms that are in there at the different levels of the, of the hierarchy of the business taxonomy. So this helps you find these, these elements in your source systems and map them then to the right actually master data element and so i'm going to show you actually in a hypothetical case an example on how how you will be doing that so the taxonomy is actually um, yeah a, a hierarchical uh, representation of all the objects for a certain domain um, it captures the properties or the attributes and stuff like that it also has specific rules to classify them it has a rigor specification, um, so if new uh, objects arrive, they can be classified within this uh, taxonomy, and it inherits all the properties of, a, of the class above it, like a, a hierarchy is. Um, so that's that's what what the taxonomy is, and where is it used for in the business? Achieve better data quality because these rules, uh, which which uh, apply, they can also be ruled be used to actually do the checking of, of data quality and yeah your data assets and the different levels and the different terms they also are very interesting and very important from a data governance point of view so the question is now how actually are you going to match this hierarchical structure with that conceptual model and then the dilemma for the raw data vault where you say we actually bring almost the data one to one to uh, the next level eh, to get automation and how can you actually match them eh? because if you look at, at the problem is that yeah on the automation you require a non-ambiguous relationship with the source system single version of the facts and on the other hand you have actually you want to see that conceptual data model at least and the business taxonomy in this in that data and there is no typically not an unambiguous relationship with the source. It's at different levels, it's uh, different terms, there are probably some transformations that need to happen. So that's called the single version of the truth. So how do you bring these two worlds together? And as, as fast as possible, of course, you want to do that already, mostly in your raw data vault, and, and then, of course, afterward in, uh, in your business data vault. So the solution is, uh, um, using that conceptual model and actually the business taxonomy to do that mapping. And so 
Um, I'm going to use like a, a small hypothetical, hypothetical case uh, actually to do that explanation. But the first thing I want to rule out is the, the enterprise data model. I came across it every time when I needed to implement a data hold, but don't do it because it actually takes away all automation and it takes away all flexibility. Um, so it's yeah, it's uh, really not a way, certainly not a way forward with uh, with the data vault implementation. Um, a second uh, possibility would be the source data vault, which means is a, a one to one mapping of your sources. Don't take into account that conceptual model and stuff like that. Just bring it over and then you go further and load up uh, of the rest or what we think is the best approach is that you really use the concepts of the raw data vault where automation is still possible, but you use that conceptual model and the business taxonomy to create already a semi integrated raw data vault layer containing that single version of the truth and that system of records where Dan is, is uh, talking about. And I'm saying semi integrated because uh, you are not allowed to have any business rule and uh, soft, soft business uh, rules. So you cannot have any logic there. So it can be that for some integration, you would need some business logic, which you probably have to do inside your business. And in, at the end, yeah, the goal is to actually uh, have in the hub and the links, the conceptual model there, because that's what you want. In this case, if you have that, you can show yeah, just by the, the canvas of the hubs and the links, you can show actually the, the model to a business and, and communicate actually at the conceptual model with the business and showing where that data is actually available in your data hold model. So let's take this hypothetical case. Uh, I'm not going to go too much in detail. You see here a hierarchy of products. So there's the product taxonomy going from products uh, uh, over vehicles, non-motor vehicles, and then more deeper inside actually the hierarchy and more detailed uh, going to a motor vehicle, passenger car, hybrid car, electric car, and having more and more uh, a detailed classification of all the products in this hypothetical vehicle selling company. The second is the, the party taxonomy, which is uh, the more the uh, party is, is the uh, abstract uh, I would say a combination of persons and organizations and in this case a very easy actually uh, taxonomy of three levels uh, going down okay so a party person and employee customer and organization and department so this is the case and our model our hypothetical model is also our conceptual model is also simple because i cannot explain everything of course in a in a complex mode, but our conceptual model is just the, cus the customer has, pur has purchased certain products. That's the, that's the case. So on, our, on the level of our taxonomy, it means we are talking about uh, the level of employee customers department, and in this case, we are customers. And products is the highest level actually of the taxonomy in uh, our product taxonomy. So that's where we have actually how the conceptual model or how the business sees actually this conceptual model uh, in our taxonomy. So in our source, let's assume now that in our source one, the, this business model level and the source model level, so our conceptual model level and the real source model level is on the same level. You see it's also at the level of the employee and customer. And on the other hand, we see that the, there is a difference in the real uh, the business level or the conceptual model level and actually the source level in the product uh, taxonomy. It's a, a passenger car, motorcycle, so it's on the third level and while our conceptual model is at the product level. Okay, so that's the, that's the case and in our second source we have the same for customers. Again, I couldn't make too many combinations or my, my model again would, would become too big. So, and in, a, in the case of products, it's on motor vehicles and non-motor vehicles in the second source. You, so you see you have, that's what I wanted to uh, show. You have different levels actually in the taxonomy coming from the different sources. 
And that's also why you need this taxonomy, because otherwise you, do, you wouldn't know that this is part actually of the product taxonomy and you wouldn't classify it actually under this product. So that's where the, the taxonomy will help you to ensure that all these, these uh, uh, objects that you need to find in your, in your source, that they will match in the right actually uh, taxonomy of the right uh, master data element typically. So one of the possible ways of working, and we all know that's not the right way, but I just wanted to show you the big difference if you do it in this way, compared to the fact that you would use the, raw, the real raw data vault approach. So in this case, you, you just bring in the source as is, and there are no business elements and, and uh, grouping of business elements across sources, neither for the, uh, the relationship, they are not uh, defined and they are not grouped. There is a one-to-one -one mapping of the source model um, to the data wall and there is no integration across sources because if you build up a source uh, data wall it means yeah there are stove pipes that you, you are loading. It's of course the fastest way yeah, to get your data into a data vault system but the question is is this the best way? And of course not otherwise I wouldn't, I wouldn't keep it but I'm just going to give you an example of how the model then will look like if you bring this, this taxonomy and the source system as they, they are into a raw data vault, which is a source uh, driven raw data vault. So in that case, you will have, of course, your hub of customers because that exists in source two. We start with source two. And if you remember, you have vehicles and uh, motor vehicles and non-motor vehicles so that was the second level in the taxonomy and of course you will have the relationships between them so you see for that one source we already have six uh, uh, eight uh, ten uh, yeah eight objects yeah so and um, this is just one part of the equations, just one of the sources. Okay. Now, if we go to the second source, we again have the, the customers. We have actually the passenger cars, the motorcycles, the electrical bicycles and the bicycles. So that was the third level. And again, we need to have that purchased relationship between all these elements. So. Uh, this will be your raw data vault. If you don't use that taxonomy, you don't use that conceptual model in the creation of your uh, raw data vault, this is what your result will look like. Uh, so that's uh, oh, certainly something very complex that the business will not really like and will not understand, that's for sure. But we are not, we are not finished yet. We just have now actually built the raw data vault. So if you look at the business data vault, huh, you will have to make the combination between huh, or integrate, huh, let's say that these keys are the, the same across the sources. Yeah, you still need to build now these same as links to link huh, the motor vehicles and all the different types of motor vehicles with uh, the passenger car, the motorcycles and the electrical bicycles. So they are again three same as links for the motor vehicles and one same as links for the non uh, motorcycle vehicles, motor vehicles. So it's, and you see, this is now uh, additionally another, a number of objects just to make the integration across the sources. And on the other hand, Again, for the customers, you see you have two customer hubs and so you will need to create actually the same as link um, across these sources to ensure that they are linked together. Right? In the hypothetical case, again, that these keys match right? and you, you didn't do that in your, in your data hole. So this is a very complex model that probably nobody likes and it also, right? it's also what uh, then we'd call a fake data vault. Eh? You wouldn't like this model at all because that's, that's not what, what the goal is in a data vault 2.0 system. But um, 
We've seen it a lot. I mean, we worked at a lot of customers and sometimes had to audit these systems and we've seen a lot of these types of, of uh, implementations where, okay, the automation of that first layer went fast, but if you don't take it into account, you see you get a big mess and at the end, you're actually going slower than first taking the time to ensure you have that conceptual model, to ensure you have a good source model that you can map these, these uh, objects onto this conceptual model and using the business taxonomy. Um, so the conclusion is in this case, you get many uh, objects in the raw data world. The conceptual model is not represented in the physical model. You don't see it at all. The business will not understand uh, because it's too complex. And you have to build a, still a lot of same as relationship manually in the business data vault. Huh? So the integration is shifted towards manually built objects and EOT loading. And that's, of course, what you want to avoid. You want to do as much automation as possible because that's where, where your gain is. That's why you do uh, in the implementation of a data vault uh, 2.0 because it, it actually brings down the manual work in your, uh, in your system. So yeah, it's a complex and manual integration work that is needed in this case. So if we look at the real approach uh, that, that we as Date, as VoltSpeed also uh, put in our tool to ensure that you could build it, actually is using that conceptual model and the business taxonomy. And you use that conceptual model to define the business element and group the business elements across sources and the same with the business relationship. You can still do a one-to-one -one mapping with your source uh, model towards the data vault and the integration across sources by using the business taxonomy of master data to group business elements together. Like I said, it will, this will help you. And when doing the source analysis, having this business taxonomy will help you find those objects that are in a certain master data element and in a certain taxonomy and then you can map it to the right uh, object in your uh, or entity in your conceptual model so that's and uh, that's very important so if we do that and use that approach uh, then we know that uh, the two customer tables actually in the sources are both actually uh, customer information, they are the business element customers, so we can bring it together on one hub, which is your hub customers, uh, which is then the same as your conceptual model, the customer uh, entity in your con uh, conceptual model. And on the other hand, we can also do the same thing with your products. Within your products, you have actually, you know that the motor vehicles and the non-motor vehicles in source uh, two, actually they are products and that the passenger car, the motorcycles, the electrical bicycles and the bicycles are all also products and they are also part of your products. So in, in our tool, uh, we call that hub groups. So you can actually very easily then map it into uh, hub groups and then you can build this model and automatically also you get this part, which is a single link across these, these elements with, of course, a satellite on that link per source because they, they will then represent actually the history of change in that relationship of a purchase relationship between customers and, and products. Okay. So, and, and this is a big difference. You see the model through the fact that you actually apply these rules, look at the the conceptual model, understand the taxonomy and know where these different elements actually go through. It shows you actually directly then that conceptual model in your canvas, what I call your canvas of links and uh, hubs. And that's what, what makes it easy because then you can actually just eh, show in the tool only the hubs and the links, for example, and then you can start talking to business and explain is this the model that you expected and they will understand the descriptive information the flexible flexibility of that and and how you store is just the satellites eh? so that's, that's the normal way of working in in uh, in data vault and then they they can they can very easily understand this model and actually yeah 
work with it. And this is this is what you want. This is the 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 easy understanding model that you you get back if you apply the right way of working in data vault and you see the satellites they are still at the level of the source so it's still a one-to-one -one, one to one mapping on that level so it's there's nothing needed for additional additional logic so that's actually the way the explanation and the way you do this use your conceptual model to ensure that you group all the things together and use the business taxonomy to know at which level these things exist and map these objects actually on the model. And so this is uh, the real raw data hold that you want to build. So the conclusion is that um, yeah, by doing this, of course, you limit the object in the raw data hold and you get yeah, really the conceptual model that is represented in the physical data model. In this way, the business will understand the model. You maybe still have to explain them that the, the relationship is in a real object. That's the only difference that you have with uh, what they probably understand about the relationship is that it's, it's a line. Normally, you will have to explain that in our case, it's a link and so it's a physical object. But it's the only difference that you need to, to explain. And the additional advantage, again, if you don't have any uh, uh, business logic that you need to actually link these objects together, uh, let's say they, they have the same keys, well, then you have, of course, the, the big advantage that you don't need any additional CMS link. Uh, and then they can just be actually automated. So the integration in this case totally happens in the, in the automation logic and not in the manual creation of the, of the loading logic for the same as links. So this is actually uh, where, of course, through volt speed, of course, we, we made, it, made it sure that we, this can be, uh, can be built actually uh, using no code or low code. Um, and here automation really meets business. If you use the right concept, and then a tool that supports the fact that it, you can group these things together in these uh, in these hub groups. Then it allows you actually to build these models, which which are very very easy to understand from a, a business perspective, and uh, gaining still keeping actually the flexibility uh, that you need from a data hold model, and also having the speed of the automation present as you would you want it to be. So if you would like to have a more detailed, uh, next to this presentation, I wrote actually a, a white paper around it. So this is something you can download from our, from our website. It's a, a more detailed description of this, actually uh, this approach together with um, the real implementation steps in VoltSpeed itself. So you get as well the explanation of what I did now in the presentation together with um, yeah, the, the implementation, the steps, the screens, as you would do it in, uh, in VoltSpeed. Okay. Some other resources we wanted to, sorry, we wanted to give you to you is that yeah, we have uh, and this presentation will, of course, be delivered to you, but we have a number of predefined, uh, actually, um, demos that you can look at for the product. And we will also be present at uh, yeah, the hands-on demo of the scale-free event uh, that the Data Dreamland. So also there, interesting to, to come at our group. So that's a little bit what I wanted to explain uh, about this uh, about this concept and how it actually works